Hi, everyone out there in podcast land. I have a really fun announcement today. As you know, the History of the Papacy podcast, Beyond the Big Screen, and Organized Crime and Punishment are all members of the Parthenon Podcast Network. Our podcaster-in-chief is Scott Rank of the History Unplugged podcast. I'm sure most of you are aware of Scott and History Unplugged. Scott has been a multiple-time guest on many of these podcast episodes. In History Unplugged, Scott presents history from a variety of perspectives, genres, and eras. Today, I'm going to share with you a part of an episode Scott produced on the surprisingly busy later part of Theodore Roosevelt's very full life. I really think you will enjoy it if you want to learn more about History Unplugged, how to subscribe, and much more. Head on over to ParthenonPodcast.com. Now enjoy this little snippet of one of Scott Rank's History Unplugged episodes, and I will talk to you soon. Scott here with another episode of the History Unplugged podcast. Teddy Roosevelt had many heroic accomplishments in his life that he performed before and after he was president. In his 20s, he was a rancher in the Dakota Territories, got in fistfights with cowboys, personally arrested thieves and brought them to justice. He led the Rough Riders, a volunteer cavalry regiment in the Battle of San Juan Heights in the Spanish-American War of 1898, was the first president to fly in an airplane and board a submarine. After his presidency, explored the Amazon River Basin. But what few people know is at the end of his life, in the 19-teens, just after the United States entered World War I against the Central Powers, tried to get the Rough Riders back together and form a regiment against the Germans that would mean riding out on horseback against 50 caliber machine guns and would very likely mean a suicide mission, or at least for anyone else but Roosevelt, who was used to facing impossible odds. Today's episode, we're going to look at the final years of Roosevelt's life with guest Bill Hazelgrove, author of the new book, The Last Charge of the Rough Rider. We look at his plans for another run of the presidency in 1920, the numerous books he wrote, but the challenges he faced at this time, particularly terrible health, since he was racked with rheumatism and embolism and pathogens in his blood. And although he wasn't able to raise up a volunteer cavalry regiment, what would have happened if he would have fought in World War I? This is an exploration of another chapter in the epic life of Teddy Roosevelt. And I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Bill Hazelgrove. If there were any other ex-president who made the rounds on media claiming that he was going to lead a military regiment and go directly into war, I would have 0% belief that were true. Take the example of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Both are men who claim multiple military deferments from the Vietnam War due to bone spurs. However, when we're talking about Teddy Roosevelt, I have more belief that he would actually jump in back into a, the saddle, literally lead a cavalry charge into war as a man in his late 50s. I'm more certain of that than I am that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. So before jumping into the story, let's look at his first charge. Can you tell me about him leading the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill and how this plants a seed for doing the same thing a couple of decades later? Yeah, well, you know, Teddy really created actually almost uh, the war with Spain when he was assistant under Secretary of the Navy. And he had been chomping at the bit a long time to get into some kind of war and have his quote unquote crowded hour. And after the Maine blew up, I remember the Maine, then TR said, I'm going, left his job, his wife, his kids, and took with him essentially a collection of cowboys, New York dilettantes, adventurers down to Texas to train and then to Cuba to fight the Spanish. And this ad hoc, you know, sort of volunteer force ends up at San Juan Hill. And of course, at war is a lot of confusion. And Roosevelt and his men are pretty much pinned down. And by the way, Roosevelt's there on a big white horse. And most of his men are walking because they couldn't get his their horses over on the Yucatan, which was this for a barge. And Roosevelt leads a charge up San Juan Hill, the Spanish retreat. Roosevelt basically declares victory. And really, through the media, he comes out as the man who won the Spanish-American War. And this sort of sets this bar of Roosevelt, you know, 
can do anything. Roosevelt, who turns around this battle, wins it, and then comes back, you know, this sort of man who's destined one way or another to be president. And so the Rough Riders, his regiment scatters to all, all parts of the United States. And again, mostly are a lot of cowboys. The Rough Riders immediately baked into this thought that American exceptionalism goes to one American can beat any five foreign fighters. And this is carried through the early part of the 20th century because you know, we're still sitting behind our oceans. We have no direct contact with any kind of warfare beyond what we've experienced in the Plains Wars. And then World War I breaks out. It makes sense that later in his life, he'll want to return to this because charging up San Juan Hill is what makes him an international celebrity. And later, when he's deep in middle age, trying to figure out the next chapter of his life, it's sort of like a man deep in middle age, thinking about his glory days, going back to his old college campus. So we'll return to this moment, but San Juan Hill wasn't the first time that Roosevelt did something like this. His character had been forged much earlier, and you wrote an entire book about his forging, specifically in the Dakota Badlands. What are events that happened there and maybe later on in his life that made him the sort of person who would lead a cavalry regiment as a sickly ex-president? Well, you know, as you know, Teddy Roosevelt was very sickly as a child. Cute asthma, Crohn's disease. It's just this this child who people really didn't think would he would make it to adulthood. So after his father gave him the famous edict of you have the mind but not the body, without the mind the body or rather without the body the mind can't go far he starts to build himself up and then of course in 1883 his wife and his mother die on the same day one of Crohn's disease the other a typhoid and he lights out for the dakotas and the badlands and this you know again in my book for general president this was my thesis that this created the teddy roosevelt the three years he spent out there and what happened was he sort of had one foot in modernity and then one foot in this classic mythology infused wild west that still existed. Geronimo was still running around out there. And so Roosevelt does all the things that one would think of almost in a movie. He confronts two bad men or one bad man in a bar. He goes into a bar late at night. I think it was in Mingusville. And this man has his guns out blazing away and and then he comes over to Roosevelt and says, you know, four eyes is going to pay. And Roosevelt ignores him. And the man hangs over and says, I said, four eyes is going to buy a drink and pay. And then Roosevelt, who's a boxer, because this is part of building himself up, says, well, if I have to, I have to. Stands up, hits him with a right, a left, and knocks the man out cold. And this is, you know, immediately his stock rises in the West. But this is just the first event of Roosevelt's, if you will, sort of transformation from this sickly kid to this barrel-chested, burly cowboy that also comes about from being on roundups, riding 24 hours, going after two bad men who go down the Missouri River in the dead of winter, and Roosevelt chases them down in a boat, reading Tolstoy, of course, and uh, brings them back to justice. And you know, just confronting Indians, he's way out on the plains, and then uh, another plains way out in the Dakotas, and... The Indians confront him. Roosevelt gets down behind the pommel of his saddle with his Winchester across it and holds off the Indians. I mean, this is all very mythic things, but Roosevelt actually did this. And also, you know, he wrote his sister, you know, I've never been healthier, you know. And Roosevelt had a great quote where he said, you know, black care rarely sits close to the rider who rides fast enough, which is his way of saying action is the tonic for everything. And his whole life, this is what he will do. He will react to grief to defeat with action. And so this three years is very transformative where he comes back a very different person and launches himself into life. And, you know, he said a couple of things about his time out West. He said, one, this was the great adventure of my life. And two, he said, I could have never been president if I hadn't gone West. And so this sort of sets up this ethos of action. Action is preeminent. If there's one scene I wish I could see, it's when Roosevelt is spending 36 hours awake marching the boat thieves back to justice. And 
having them tied up at night in order to keep himself awake. He's reading Anna Karenina to them. And as these barely literate cowboys are shivering in the dark, they're utterly baffled as this guy is reading about the petty politics and machinations of upper class Russian society with the women in their petticoats and thinking, what have I got myself into? I have no idea what's going on. Must have been the most baffled person who ever lived and existed. Some other high points in his life that also play into his health as we're leading up to World War I are the events of 1912, both during the election where he's giving a speech and it's cut short, but then immediately after when he goes on an expedition, both of these events speak to his character, but also affect his health and explain why he isn't in the best of shape leading up to the First World War. So could you speak to some of these events that happen? Oh, uh, yeah. The first event was Roosevelt was up in the Milwaukee Convention Center and to give a speech, and a man named John Schrank was waiting for him. And Roosevelt was sitting in a car, and he thought this man wanted to shake his hand. And so Roosevelt stands up and goes to shake his hand. The man shoots him in the chest, I think it was a thirty-eight, And the bullet goes through his glasses case, and then through his speech, he had a big army coat on, and went through that, and lodges in his ribs. And so he checks in his mouth to see if he's bleeding from his lungs or anything, finds out he's not. And everybody from him said, well, you've got to go to the hospital. He says, nonsense. I came to give a speech. I'm going to give a speech. And so he goes into the Milwaukee Convention Center, and or actually the Milwaukee Coliseum, and he gives a speech. It goes on for 90 minutes. And he says, friends, I need you to bear with me. I've just been shot. And he shows everybody his bleeding shirt under his coat. And people are just stunned. And, you know, he gets to utter the immortal lines. It takes more than a bullet to stop a bull moose. And, you know, and then he comes off the stage. They take him to, they whisk him to a hospital down in Chicago on a train. He sleeps like a baby. And they have to leave the bullet in anyway. So, again, who else would go and speak after being shot? <laughs> and not only speak, he was originally going to speak for 60 minutes, but then he, he extended it. And then, of course, Roosevelt, after the election, goes down the Amazon. And this is so Roosevelt. He goes down to the river. It was called the River of Doubt on this expedition for the National Geographic Society. And he takes his son with him, Kermit. And of course, things go bad. The expedition has, there's a murder that takes place. They're running out of food. They get lost. Roosevelt cuts his ankle and the septic infection immediately sets in, you know, in the jungle. And he gets very ill and he, he says, look, leave me here. Go on. You can't take me out. I'll just die here. He has his morphine with him to carry him off. And his son says, no, I'm not leaving. Then that means and Roosevelt realizes that his son will die too. And so then that gets him out of the jungle. But, you know, again, this sort of action following defeat. But I will say the Amazon, of all the things that Roosevelt did, really probably broke his health more than anything else because he came out of it with a chronic infection, with malaria, other pathogens in his blood. He lost probably 40 to 50 pounds, and he never quite recovered, you know, from this big adventure. That helps frame the next chapter because, not to say that he has a death wish, but he is probably more cognizant than any other adventure that jumping into World War I could finish him off. And perhaps he doesn't see that as a bug, but a feature going out gallantly with his last ounce of strength. Well, let's look at the request itself that he gives to Woodrow Wilson to lead his own regiment. What was this request? And it sounds crazy because when we think of World War I, we imagine machine gun nests mowing down people. But this isn't as crazy because we're still in the light of the late 19th century. Cavalry is a primary unit of any sort of military assault. So this isn't as crazy as it sounds, although it's still something. So what was this request and how did it make sense in the times? Well, you know, Roosevelt, he always imagined or fantasized about getting the Rough Riders together. When Taft was president and trouble started in Mexico, he wrote a letter to Taft saying, hey, I can get the Rough Riders fired up and go down there and, and get Pancho Villa and, 
you know, these Mexicans who have been raiding the border and killing Americans and all that. Well, it didn't come about. And so he sort of shelved it. Well, World War I is on the horizon. And Wilson and Roosevelt, just to set the stage, hate each other, basically. Ever since Wilson beat him in 1912. And and also, they're very different men. You know, Wilson is this sort of iconoclastic Princeton professor who's very interior. Roosevelt is all exterior. Roosevelt is just charge ahead. He's sort of, Wilson calls him a great big boy. And when war starts to appear on the horizon with Germany and ships are getting sunk, you know, Roosevelt just basically roasts Wilson and calls him a coward, lily-livered skunk, just a molly coddle, everything he can think of to needle him into declaring war on Germany. And Roosevelt is merciless. But during this time, too, as war comes, Roosevelt starts writing Secretary Baker letters saying, listen, I can resurrect the Rough Riders. I will lead a division of Rough Riders against the Germans. And, you know, I can go over right away. And this is ignoring, well, as he said before, the war had changed. Warfare had changed. Now, most historians have glanced over this as just this crazy old man at the end of his life, you know, kind of going off the rails. But that's just not true. If you look at the newspapers of the day, they're all for Roosevelt going. And I don't mean in a little way. I mean, being headlines that say, Roosevelt to go to France, Roosevelt raising division, editorial saying, you know, Roosevelt should go over there. And basically what they're saying is, look, Americans are superior. You know, we'll show these British and French how to fight. Because again, you know, there is no radio. We have no television. We're behind our oceans. We hear of this crazy trench warfare, but it, it, there's no reality to it for us. In our last war, we were had men on horseback charging each other, and, it, we, and again, the plains wars against the Indians, it was very one-sided. So Roosevelt come in along saying, you know what, I can do this, and people support him. Well, you know, he starts to elaborate this with Baker, who he drives crazy, basically, because Baker writes him back saying, listen, you know, this has to go through Congress, and this is not really something we want to do. Well, Roosevelt ignores him and says, no, no, I've got a whole plan. So he writes him basically a 16-page letter outlining his division. He's going to have, you know, machine gun division. He's going to have an ambulance division. So it's sort of like a super rough riders, if you will. And, you know, I will lead it. You know, Roosevelt felt that a lot of times, you know, they didn't want to use their manpower for his division or their officers. So Roosevelt's like, you know, I don't need any of your officers. But at the same time, the military establishment couldn't stand Roosevelt. Why? Because they have a very long memory and they remember how he hogged all the glory in 1898 with Spain and how he wouldn't follow orders and and basically eclipsed the regular army. And you think about it, here's the regular army that was sent over to Cuba to you know fight the spanish here comes this guy with his cowboys and takes basically says i won the war the military couldn't do anything so they don't want that repeated so this is sort of the setup if you will and it's coming down to henry cabot lodge who is roosevelt's best friend and also loathes woodrow wilson he lodge famously said i never thought i'd loathe anybody as much as i do woodrow wilson and that's because they're basically really alike. They both think they're the smartest guys in the room. And Roosevelt's the Republican, le- or rather, Lodge is the Republican leader. Well, he gets through the house, amazingly. You know, this wasn't just a crazy notion. He gets Roosevelt's division past the OK through the house. So the headlines then all over the United States are Roosevelt going to France. The resolution passes the house. All Woodrow Wilson has to do is sign off on it. It's attached to the draft bill. War has been declared. And Roosevelt's all set to go. So Congress has said, yes, we back this. We back you going over there with your 250,000 men. And Roosevelt boasted this is how many he had signed up. Men all over the country wanted to go with him. And so this was taken out of the fantasy realm very much. This was not this crazy notion, which is sort of history sort of handed to us that you know, this was just some sort of little weird footnote. It really wasn't. 
And the British and the French desperately wanted Roosevelt to come over. They thought this would be great. I mean, they are losing the war. The Germans are just, you know, plowing them down. And they think if Roosevelt goes over there, comes over, gets killed, which he probably would, great. The United States are, is in it lock, stock, and barrel. And, you know, what a great PR thing. So really, Roosevelt, he's getting support from all sides and the press is supporting him. And it's really up to Woodrow Wilson. 